Or any. Let's take our Bibles to Hebrews this evening. Hebrews chapter number five, as we dive right in to our continuing our series, and Jesus is greater, as the pretty much what the author of Hebrews was trying to bring across. And tonight we're going to dive into what many what what be considered more of a doctrinal truth. Uh, many in here uh, would not really know much about or find important enough the office of high priest. But I think tonight we're going to learn not only some doctrinal truths, but how it helps us. Excuse me, when I mean help us, I mean how it gives us some foundational truth. One of the things I want us, one thing I love about expositional, is a lot of times you get to a passage, if you're just looking for the easiest passages to preach, one, you wouldn't go to Hebrews, but two, uh, you'd skip a lot of them. But as I was studying this, I'm going to tell you, it, it's much more, much more simplistic. And is it practical? Some of what we're talking about in the Old Testament priesthood won't be practical, but if we understand it, it will make much more sense in how it applies to us doctrinally today. A lot of times, if someone were to bug you about your position. I'll give you one example of one. Um, if someone were, and tonight this is how it works. Well, if someone were to bring up to you, do you know if you die today, you go to heaven? Yes, I do. All right. Uh, can you lose your salvation? No, I can't. How do you know that? Some of us have verses we'd run to, and but here's the question. This has happened to me. I'll give them those verses, and then they will find a way to twist those verses in a way that you've never heard. You walk away saying, oh, I've never heard that. Sometimes just a little more foundational principle will help to not shake. And that's what we're going to do tonight in that doctrine. Tonight, the message is Jesus is the greater high priest, the greater high priest. Hebrews chapter five, you follow along as I begin reading. Actually, what I want to do in context, it's broken up in paragraph, but the beginning of verse five talks about every high priest. It starts with four. Really, it's, it's continuing from chapter 4, verse 16. So let's read chapter 4, verse 16. The Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained, for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can, um, who can have compassion of, of the ignorant and on them that are go out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought, as for the people, so also for himself to offer for sins. And no man taketh his honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. As he saith also in another place, Thou art the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Who in the days of flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, was strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation, and to all of them that obey, called of God, and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Father, we are grateful for the time you give us tonight in these few moments may be helpful. Father, I know at first a lot of introductory level of historical truths. Uh, Father, I pray at the end we would see the foundational doctrinal strength that this will give us, Lord, in our daily lives. And just another reminder of a truth that, Father, we hold to very strong. We love you. Pray you be a help and encouragement tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at this tonight, how many of you, I'm going to start with this, how many of you have ever heard the name Melchizedek? Wow, a lot. I'm impressed. It's an evening crowd, Sunday, Sunday Bowl, Super Bowl Sunday night. I shouldn't be surprised by that. How many of you say, I know exactly who he is? All right, that went down a little bit. That usually goes down even, for, even in Bible college. Now, in Bible college, if you ask, who's Melchizedek? Man, the scholars jump out and they start yelling and hollering. And by the way, chapter seven of Hebrews is all about Melchizedek. So at some point, we will be able to wax eloquent on all of the details of Melchizedek. We're not going to wax eloquent in all of the details of Melchizedek tonight. We'll spend a little bit of time with them explaining what it is. But sometimes we see that and say, is that really important? Let me, let me tell you why it is a bit important. I have some of this at the end of the message too. A lot of times we look at the word of God and we say, Lord, I'm hurting, I'm struggling. I'd like truth and encouragement. And that's great. But there are times that foundational truths are absolutely necessary when you're falling apart. When you wonder about eternal security, when you wonder about these things. The Bible teaches us that we're supposed to teach line upon line, priest upon priest, up here a little, there a little. 
So there is an absolute necessity for us to be grounded in the word of God. And, and I'm not gonna say you remember everything you heard tonight. I hope I make it as practical as I can. I'm not gonna say, oh, I remember in Hebrews 5 and go back and attack somebody who doesn't believe in eternal security. I'm not saying that. But what it does is it gives you a strong foundational truth that helps in, in just the other times when Satan comes into your mind. And it's necessary. And the Bible teaches us, is it study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman with needeth not to be the same, rightly dividing the word of truth. So tonight, for a few minutes, I'm gonna look at three thoughts from the idea of Jesus' work as a high priest, which is truly foundational and ultimately in our hope of salvation. So quickly tonight, number one, the purpose of the office of priest. The purpose, I won't reread the verses tonight, but verses one through four, Jesus breaks down, or Paul, excuse me, breaks down really what the office of priest was. Now, let me explain a little bit. I said in verse 16 was part of the context. It is and it isn't, let me explain why. In that verse, he tells us to come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And then he jumps into explaining the high priest. How does that fit? When we understand Jesus' position as a high priest, it gives us permission to come boldly before the throne of grace. That's the problem, premise here. So why can I come boldly before the throne of grace? Because of who Jesus is and what he's done for me. So I can come boldly, and, and as we said this morning, claim the promises of God. Why? Because of who he is, and this is all part of us learning who he is. So let me break down real quickly the premise of what he's saying. First of all, he talks about the high priest was not necessarily someone who chose it, but he was called by God. He was ordained by God. This section also talks about the fact that the high priest was human, as we know. He made his own mistakes. He sinned. And so he wasn't some superior being lording over the people that he was to be over. He, he was to teach. He was to preach. But ultimately, he was, he was just as sinner as anyone else. Now, the high priest was very different. Uh, the Old Testament study of the Word of God was very different. Remember, one, they didn't even have the whole Word of God. As you go to the Old Testament, it was still being written while it was going on. Even the New Testament, they had the completed Old Testament. So they're being trained. The, you know, they're looking at prophecies and so teaching. But the ultimate job of the high priest was to ultimately make atonement for the sins of the people. Now, let me give you a thought. Today, the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, what do we do? And we, he's faithful and just. If we sin, to confess them. And what we do, we come before God, we ask God to forgive us, and we move forward. It's simple. Isn't, it, isn't that simple? Aren't you glad that once a year, you don't have to take a 300-mile trip to Israel, might be a couple thousand by now, but a 300-mile trip down to the city, the capital of the city, and spend a couple days there to receive atonement for your sin because that's what they had to do in the Old Testament. They would have to go into Jerusalem for the day of atonement and they would have to go in and what would happen is in the, old, in the older times it was the tabernacle, then it became the temple. But they would all come together, they would offer their sacrifices and then the high priest would take the blood and he would go in to the Holy of Holies. The, the temp, tabernacle and temple are broken up into two sections, well three, the outer court, the holy place and then the Holy of Holies. Only the high priest was allowed to go in the presence of God. And he would take the blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat of the altar. I think all a picture of what Jesus would do one day when he came to the cross. So he comes in, he does that, and he makes what we call atonement for sin. Now let me explain what, why, why that word is important. The word atonement means covering. It does not mean eliminating. It does not removing. It simply means covering. So that means when Jesus went to the mercy seat in heaven, when, when he died on the cross, what did he do? He eliminated sin, right? He paid the price. He said, it's over. But up to that point, there was a covering. So once a year, the priest would go before the presence of God for the people, and he would make atonement, a covering for the sin. Why is that important? Because they did not have completion of sin in the Old Testament. They were looking forward to the cross. All of this was to look forward to the cross when the Lamb of God would shed his blood upon the cross for us. That was all looking forward. So the high priest is a very, very important position. It was one, as, the, as this pastor says, wasn't just handed to anybody. You had to, it was given mostly by the fact you're part of Levinical background, and, and it was given for a very specific reason, very, very important. But the key to remember is that there was still a separation between God and man, since sin had not been completely dealt with. Those in the Old Testament look forward to the completed work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We today look back at the accomplished work on the cross. We also see that these men were chosen by 
and ordained by God. This was not just someone randomly who did it. The one comparison you can make today, we do not believe in priests or high priests today, but the position of pastor, those who would hold that, same idea. Here's some simple points. They are called by God. They don't just say, I want that. My, my grandfather used to say, I, I, we, he was, I didn't get to see him a whole lot growing up, and every once in a while he talked to us, but one of the things he used to say that my dad, I, my dad and I and he I talked about a little bit was he called the pulpit a sacred desk. That what's happening here is extremely important. Number one, that's not necessarily just for you to know, that's more for me to know. That what the person who comes up here and shares, it's not just, well, I gotta get three points in a poem for tonight's message. I, I, it's not just filling 30 minutes of time. There should be time of prayer. There should be time to study. There should be time of just wrestling with God. Do you want this? What do you want? And by the way, that does happen. It happens, uh, one of the things I do, every once in a while people come, I come back to my office, like, where have you been? Or where'd you go? They think I, like, I just disappeared from McDonald's the whole day. That would be awesome, but at least for breakfast. I like to disappear around the building for several reasons. One sounds real spiritual. You go to a spot, you can pray you know, for that spot. You can pray for the nursery, pray for this. You know the other reason is, when you disappear, no one knows where you are. And you can pray without distraction. And it's, it's nice. I mean, it looks spiritual when someone walks in you and you're on your knees. Uh, it's embarrassing when you've been woken up. No, I'm kidding there. But it's, but it's nice, to pray, but there is, and that's the point. It should be serious. And therefore, when we come to church, we don't just come and say, let's get through another service, hope it goes quick tonight. What can I gain? Because what's been given is from God. The purpose of the high priest was important to stand between God and the people. I don't do that. I stand on behalf of God for the people, but very differently. Why is this important today, though? To understand this process helps us to have a stronger understanding of all that Jesus did. So now that we see the original priest office, look at number two, the permanence of Jesus, the priest. Go back to verse number five, and let's read that again, if I can find it. It says, so also Christ glorified himself not to be made a high priest, but that he said, thou art my son, today have I begotten. He simply put, he didn't put himself there. God the Father placed himself there in the position of high priest. Uh, verse six, he saith also in another place, thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek who is the days of his flesh when he'd offered up prayers and supplications. I'm ahead of myself. Let's stay with these two verses. We see that he did not put himself here. He was placed by God. Now, this one is where you see the Trinity can get somewhat tricky. Jesus is God, correct? But now Jesus is obedient to God in this passage, correct? How do you do both? Was he obedient to himself? We could spend all, if you really get down to it. Now, we're not to make it too complicated. God is one, but God is three. And God allows us to see him working in three different points of view for us to understand. That's as simple as it is. So God the Son was in obedience, placed as the high priest over everything. But here is some of the distinctions that make him a little different. His office was different in a very important way. And it comes from that fancy word, Melchizedek. Now, let me explain a little bit of what here it is in Melchizedek. Right? Now, there's a lot of different points of view. Some believe he was just a really good priest. Some believe he was a very important priest. Um, I have a tendency to believe, and some may disagree with me, but I'll just say my belief. I believe that he was what many call a Christophany. A Christophany is when Jesus took the form of a man and walked the earth. Uh, when Abraham was arguing with God, Christophany. Sometimes I believe that's what it was. Let me tell you why I believe that. In chapter 7, you can flip ahead if you want, but chapter 7, first three verses, says this. It describes Melchizedek. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being an interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now catch what it says in verse three. This man is without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the son of God, abideth a priest continually. Who can do that but God? I mean, we could argue a lot, but that to me is the most simplistic way. It, that describes divinity right there. So to me, I believe that this, and here's the point why. 
The picture of Melchizedek was a physical priest because Jesus was not part of the Old Testament. But what he's saying is Jesus is not in the line of the priesthood of the Old Testament. Here's why that's important. The priests of the Old Testament were, number one, men. As we noticed, they were sinners. Number two, they died. Jesus did not. He was from God, ordained by God, and he lives forever. It's the permanence of his office. Now, that's important. Again, it doesn't seem like a big deal until you start getting into why that's important. The important aspect of this information is that Jesus was not from the same office. His office is divine, and it shows permanence. In verse 9 of this passage, it says that Jesus speaks of being made perfect and becoming the author of our salvation. Jesus did not have to be made perfect. That means complete. What it means in the end of this section was that Jesus had completed everything he'd been sent here to do in his office. He had come. He was the high priest. He had gone to the garden, basically born, lived, suffered, and died and rose again. Completing. Why is that important? All of that was necessary to purchase salvation. It had to be a human. So Jesus came born of a, of a woman. It had to be a perfect sacrifice, spotless lamb in the Old Testament. And so Jesus lived his entire life, Hebrews says, tempted life as we are yet without sin. He comes to the garden, as we see in this section of Scripture, suffering, but then goes to the cross, dies and rises again, completing the entire process, completing his purchase. He's, he's dealing with the holiness of God, the wrath of God, and the love of God all at one time, offering us something. Now, I understand most of us, we know this to be true, but important doctrine of truth. If this office wasn't permanent, neither would our salvation be. See, our salvation is not found in ourselves. Our salvation is not found in our works. Our salvation is not found in our righteousness. None of it's found in us, our church, or anything. It's found in him. Remember we said this morning, the person of God. So since my righteousness comes from God, if it could end, what else could end? my righteousness. And therefore, those who don't believe in eternal security have a valid point. Because if the one I place my trust in is temporary, therefore, it so is the trust. If the one I, that I base my promise of eternity off, off of is temporary, so is the promise. The promise is only as good as the person lives. Jesus in his high priestly office is divine and he's permanent. Jesus did not need to become complete or perfect. He was and is God. But he completed the process of salvation by becoming man, paying the price to man for sin, and now stands between us and God on our behalf. In 1 Timothy 2, 5, this is where it becomes practical today. It says this, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. We spent a lot of time on the idea of ransom. You know, when someone's been kidnapped, they want a ransom. He gave himself that ransom for those of us who did not deserve it. Let me explain how this passage is practical today. In the Old Testament, remember I said the high priest was the only one that can go into the Holy of Holies. There was a large veil between those two. As I've said this before, the high priest would wear bells on his robe. That way you could tell if he was still moving. If the bells stopped ringing, he probably wasn't alive. They'd also wrap a rope around his foot because the last thing you want to do is the high priest simply means the high priest was full of sin, had not gotten right with God, walked in the presence of God with sin and was killed. Now, you can look back and say, man, that's a mean and rough God. Is it a mean and rough God or is it a holy God? Isn't it so often that we want to keep putting God right back down on our level? God, that just seems mean. That's just rude to kill somebody because he walked in the presence of God. Now, he walks in the presence of God and then goes to heaven. It's not a really bad thing, but he walks in the presence. And we sit back and say, God, God is so, that's just, that's mean. I, yeah. When we do stuff like that, you know what we do? God, how dare you be God? How dare you claim holiness? Uh, one of the football quarterbacks in our league made a comment. He grew up religious and he said, I just can't believe in a God who complains to be loving, but he'll throw everybody who doesn't agree with him in hell. Now, that offended his family, who was very religious. And so I looked at that, and I thought, well, there's obviously somebody who grew up and whatever reason got angry by religion. But you know the struggle I have with that? Number one, we could debate the fact that God doesn't send people to hell. He put a son on the cross. You don't have to go to hell. It's a silly point. God has offered salvation. It's my sin that puts me in hell. But you know my biggest problem with that argument was? 
Who does this quarterback or whoever think he is to tell God how he's got to do something? Do we not in our country and our, oh dear, oh God, I don't like this. You don't do this. You don't do this. You don't do this. Fine. Disagree with them and find out what happens. Years ago, there was a preacher who was preaching here as an evangelist, and uh, he was one of those bombastic guys. Some of you know his name, Stan Harris. And uh, he said something. When he first said it, I'm like, I don't know about this. He always said these crazy things just to wake people up. And so he, told, he said this. He goes, I'm going to tell you, there are going to be no unbelievers in hell and no believers in heaven. And I'm like, man, I want to see where he's getting this doctrine from. He knows what he said. When people get to hell, you know what they're going to do? I believe. And when they get to heaven, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. When it's all said and done, it doesn't make a difference what I think or what I believe. It's what he said. And Jesus in his permanence, in his office. Now, here's what happens. Jesus came and he, and he died. He rent the veil in two. Ripping, and I won't go into detail how hard that was. It would take multiple men to hang this thing. From top to bottom, cuts it open and up. Now we can go, verse 16, boldly into the throne of grace. This is why. Now I can go boldly into the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need because the high priest's position was completed on the cross and he holds it permanently. Now they don't go to the priest's in the temple, we go because of the high priest of the presence of God. There is one God and one mediator between God and men. It's not me. It's not any church. It is Jesus, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. That's why we can come boldly. And you say, I know this, but it's one thing to know. It's another thing to understand why and how. I hope you don't just get comfortable knowing the fluff. Because somebody's going to get up and they're going to say something, oh, really? Oh, I'm going to get lost. And because we know the fluff, guess what? We're going to get confused. I can go boldly before the throne of grace and I don't have to go through a priest, not because I'm a Baptist and not a Catholic. That's not the only reason. It's a very weak reason. You know why? Because I have a high priest who stands between me and God and he mediates for me on my behalf. Let me explain how it works in heaven. Satan comes to the presence of God and he accuses us of sin. Let me ask you, is he right? Yeah, he does not have to make anything up. He's just got to watch. That's all he's got to do. And he comes up to God. And now, I've always found this interesting. This is how arrogant Satan is. Satan knows God, the presence of God. He's, he knows how powerful God is, but somehow he thinks he goes to an all-knowing God and thinks he forgot. But you know what he's actually doing? Here's what Satan does. God shows love and grace to us. You know what Satan does? He shows our sin and how we're smearing it in the face of God. God, you gave your only son for these people. You gave everything. You constantly forgive them. And what do they do? They just mock you with their sin. Is that not exactly what's happening? No. You see, if we can see it differently, if we can see it from that perspective, it changes everything, and Satan's right. And while he stands, he goes, God, are you not a holy God? You have to do something about it, and he's right. And as he's saying this, Jesus steps in front and says, I already did something about it. It's dealt with. It is finished. You know why God even allows Satan back in his presence? I don't. Nothing else, just to remind him of what Jesus did permanently, hell for us forever. Now he stands permanently. Because of his work, we are not considered righteously, I'm sorry, because of his work, we are considered righteous positionally and free from condemnation of sin. Interesting, one of the premises, we talk about the term Baptist. Uh, it's not really a denomination for us since we're what we call independent Baptists, but we use the word Baptist as an acrostic to break down our, our affiliation. I won't go through all of them. If you've been through our foundations class, you've heard this. The first three, the first one is biblical authority. The Bible is the only rule of faith and practice. It's not tradition-based. Individual soul liberty. You do as God leads. It's not my job. My job is to teach, to preach, be done. You do what God has you to do with it. Now, hopefully, if the Bible says that we have to obey it, but that's between you and God, not you and me. The third one is what's known as the priesthood of the believer. When we get saved, all of us become believer priests. We have the same power to go in the presence of God as the Old Testament priests did. And that's what each and every one is, positionally are, righteous before God. This is what we gain from Jesus. 
We hold the position ourselves, which is why Paul could say in the last chapter that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. This is also the core of our foundation of eternal security. Jesus paid the price, calling it finished. Jesus then cut the veil and temple, giving us access to the presence of God. And because he lives forever, we will always have it. This is the core, because this is what we will never lose. We hear one of these verses in 1 John 5, 13, where it says, These things have I written unto you, I believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe in the name of the Son of God, because of all of these truths. Let's look at number three as we finish, the personal nature of Jesus the priest. Go back to verse number seven of chapter five. It says, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, was strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard, and that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of salvation unto all them that obey him. Those three verses specifically talk about his time in the Garden of Gethsemane. He cried up tears, begging God for salvation. Remember that? What he just says, God, if this cup can pass from me, but not, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. We could spend a lot of time debating that. I've heard three points of view, but I'll tell you what I believe it is. When Jesus, when Jesus says, may this cup pass from, I don't think Jesus is saying, I don't want to go to the cross. I think maybe what he was saying. Lord, some have said that Jesus, Satan was trying to kill him in the garden. Nah, there's some possible points of view behind that. You know what I think Jesus is saying? God, is there any other way? I really don't want to go through this. What's coming ahead of me is frightening. It's scary. Can I even make it to the cross? Is there any other way? But nevertheless, if this is the only way, I'll do it. God the Son in human form sat in the garden and said, Lord, if there's any other way, showing the true fearful nature of what Jesus was about to face. He, can you imagine he knew his whole life what he was about to face? He'd seen it happen in his life. And now he's got to look ahead at it. Wouldn't that be a little bit scary? He was still human. He was going to feel all the pain for you and for me. And he said, but Lord, if this is your will, I'll do it. That personal nature is what allows us to come to God. Hebrews often talks about that Jesus is not just a high priest or not just a divine God. He's personal in that nature so that I can go to him. So when I go to him in chapter, in the chapter four, I may be hurting and a calloused heart is what is needed to heal me. I may be angry and I need help. I may be empty and need someone to fill me. I may, be, I, I, I may just be lost and I need direction. I don't go to him waiting for him to calm me down. I go to him waiting for him just to guide and direct. Aren't you glad we go to a personal God? This, when we talk about having a relationship with God, this is the premise, the foundation of all of that. Let me give you a couple thoughts. When we think about it, we, when we hear what these things, why do we study these things? We're to take ownership of what we have been given. A couple of verses, Philippians 2.12, wherefore my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not, only, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. I need to learn these things so I have a stronger understanding of why, not just what. We are to be growing in our knowledge of God and his word, which is also seen in 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman with needeth not to be the shame, rightly dividing the word of truth. We also see in 1 Corinthians 3, and I, brethren, cannot speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are not, for ye are carnal. For as, for as there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? You know what the simple principle is? The deeper I get into this, the more I understand this, the less I get around with the little things. So the world, we get so stuck in our Christian world, missing the little things. He said, listen, he said, I couldn't give you this stuff because I had to treat you like babes. This is important because God wants us to grow and mature and learn. Some of you, you know all this. You've read this. You knew it was coming. Some of you are like, I'm still kind of lost in the whole chapter five, verse two part. I'm still there. Go home and look at it. Look at it. Study it. Look ahead. Make this part of the core of what you hold to. And you know what? If someone comes doesn't believe in it, take them to Hebrews. They will have no idea what you're talking about. You will sound smart and they won't be able to debate it because no one goes to Hebrews five for that. The core of all that Jesus did for us. Lord, we love you. We thank you for the time you've given us this evening. We're grateful, Lord, for this true 
doctrinal premise and understanding of our, etern our guaranteed eternal home in heaven based upon the work of the great high priest, Jesus.